So you might have seen the epic short film Chalk Warfare 4. There's something like 60 million views on this damn thing. It's got amazing visual effects, epic shots and epic action sequences, as well as starring recognizable YouTube talent like Zach King, Jamie Costa, Star Wars Theory, Hello, I'm Lana, Dom Ferrer, Tiana Weberly, video co-pilot Sam Lawyer, and so many others. So in this video, the director Sam Wickert from So Crispy Media sits down to talk about the creative process and everything involved in creating the viral hit Chalk Warfare, both from the perspective of a filmmaker as well as a visual effects artist. We talk about everything from Tyflo and Phoenix FD, 3ds Max, and dozens of other tools used in this film and so much more. I want to talk about Chalk Wars, obviously. You just put out the fourth one. How did the first three come about? So early on, we were making content on the YouTube channel and nothing was really sticking. Uh, video game content was becoming very popular at the time. And, and this was, again, around like the 2010 to 2014 era. Uh, video game content was popular, but it, we were making skits, comedy stuff, uh, very minor video game stuff, not necessarily like, high-end, uh, you know, references or whatnot, but nothing was really sticking that we were making. We had some, you know, some good viewership and we were developing an audience, but it wasn't until we had this idea for Chalk Warfare, where my buddy Eric that I work with uh, came up with the idea, you know, and usually I'm, I direct the projects, I'm behind the camera most of the time, I also uh, handle the visual effects side of things, uh, but when it comes time for writing, we typically, you know, bat off ideas, and he came up with this idea and we thought of it a year before we even made the video. It was too difficult to even wrap my head around at the time, too difficult to wrap my head around how I could even achieve the effect of, you know, pulling a chalk gun, have, having an actor draw a chalk weapon, draw something out of chalk and then pull it out of the wall. That was just too difficult to figure out how to do. You know, it wasn't in my wheelhouse of, of expertise yet. And through the years, through that year of making content, we had made a video right before that involved me having to replace a weapon. We had a little action scene and I had to replace a weapon. So I built a cardboard prop and then replaced it with a 3D weapon. Mm -hmm. After we finished that video, I realized we can finally do this idea. We can finally make the chalk warfare video that we wanted to make. So we just got some guys together. Uh, it was a really simple idea. And if like you watch the fourth one versus the first one, you can see a drastic difference in pretty much like the buildup between them. You know, it's, it's a weird jump if you were to go from one to four, because the first one was really simple. It was just like a minimum viable product. You know, uh, it was like we had four guys. So it was a team of two versus two. And we shot it in an afternoon, the film. And uh, I had cardboard cutouts. So there was some pre, there was some work in pre-production, obviously, to create the cardboard cutouts. And I had developed the chalk weapons on the computer. And we just had these actors hold these uh, stencils, or rather the cardboard. And we, I just went through the painstaking process of painting those things out frame by frame. Not the most, uh, not the smartest way to do it, but at the time with the tech that was available, you know, there was like planner tracking. I wasn't even aware of synth eyes, <laughs> uh, but I did planner tracking and I did a lot of uh, actual just frame by frame animation to get those weapons to stick to their, uh, to, to stick to their original weapon that they're holding. And then of course, after that, then I have to go in and roto those hands. So just a lot of work, but for just an afternoon of shooting. And when you're looking at something for that long, you hate it. Like I hated the video. I thought it was the worst thing we had ever created. It felt terrible because I was looking at every frame for probably like a month of doing that work, right? Because it's a short film, it was like two minutes. Anyways, finally finished it and we just uploaded it on the internet and the thing just explodes. Like we had, I think, I don't think it hit a million views right off the bat, but it, it got really close, which was, and again, at the time, this was huge for YouTube. It was probably 2012 or 13. It's, I think it had like 500 to 750,000 views, maybe somewhere around there. And a lot of uh, blogs were picking it up, Gizmodo, uh, you know, I think Business Insider did a thing on it. Like all these companies, we're picking this thing up and tossing it around. And it was just wild to see and like just the response and everyone enjoying the references that we did. Uh, 
I don't even think we had a reference in the first one. Now I think about it, they're all just generic weapons. Uh, but we, we just did all of this. We just made the film and the concept was proven by people enjoying it. So of course, then we decided we're going to make a second one. <laughs> you, you have something that's successful. You, you jump on and you make a second one. And we had a video project in between that, finalized it, finished it up, but then we started on Chalk Warfare 2. And Chalk Warfare 2 was one of the first ones that we really started with the, the weapon uh, integration uh, with having references because it was all, it all became this idea of we want to make it bigger, right? Each time we want to improve on the last one. And that's where it started to get really difficult was because the second one was good. We improved it. And then we took a hiatus because that one went viral as well. And it came out a few months after, or a couple months after, I believe, uh, after Chuck Warfare won. And it did really well, the same success. And our audience was growing. And they obviously wanted more Chuck Warfare. But by this point, you know, after explaining all that work that had to go involved with those, you can probably imagine I was like, me, a single VFX guy on this project, I was burned out. I, bet. I couldn't do, I couldn't do it anymore. Like I couldn't, I couldn't roto out hands frame by frame for any more for, for these three to five minute long videos. It was just a lot of work and the, the tracking processes and everything was just not ideal. And I, I knew that there was improvements that could be made and they needed to be made. Regardless, we continued making content and then we made the third one uh, years later. It always, it always comes time where we, we, like two years down the road, we go, you know what? We need to make another Chalk Warfare. And people are still asking for them on our channel. So we decided we'll make another one. We improved the process a lot with the third one. Still was a lot of work and it still was a huge increase because at the same rate at which we increase with our productivity, uh, the level of quality also increases. So we end up spending equal amount of effort and equal amount of time, sometimes even more on the latest one. But third one still did well. So we were extremely excited about that because it had been two years. So it kind of proved to us that like we could, we could take a break and make the content. And people really seem to enjoy the third one a lot more than the, the second one or the first one because one, we did something that was unique, I think, at the time. And we were talking about this earlier, which was pretty cool, is Social media unlocks something that really you've never seen with content before because we were able to jump in and ask our audience before we produced the film what weapons they wanted to see. So like, so if I were to ask you that, you know, I don't know what you would pick. What, what would you want to see as a chalk warfare weapon? For some reason, I'm thinking of Predator. The, uh, yeah, no, like, that, okay, so you know, that Predator. actually is, <laughs> people really wanted that. I'm mad we never did it, but... <laughs> We asked the audience and people were able to vote and that created like a, I think that created a certain amount of an anticipation for the film, you know? Yeah. Ironically, it still took us like six months to make it. The third one took a really long time for us to make because we had some 3D assets for the first time and we were doing some simulations with fume effects, uh, some particle sims. That was when we first started dabbling with chalk particle sims and whatnot. But people seem to really enjoy that. And that was something that we couldn't do anywhere else because it's social media, right? We're able to ask them for the weapon suggestions. So we were just, we loved the response that the third one had. And that was kind of it. Like we didn't, we didn't, we didn't feel like we could top it again, you know, and time went on and VR became a thing. So we kind of got involved with the VR craze as VFX artists, you know, it's, it was, it was fun to be a part of that because it introduced us to real-time rendering and we were able to make some really fun projects on our YouTube channel with Google Daydream as well that we were really excited about. And then at a certain point, once we hit around 2019 to 2020, we realized it was time to make a Chalk Warfare 4 because it had always been in our heads. And you know, this is six years later. Mm -hmm. Six years is a really long time for the internet. Things change. Like the internet seems to go through these phases where it's like three years, it completely changes. But six years go by and we decide it's time to make another one. So Chuck Warfare 4, that's, that, that's the process. But <laughs> while we talk about opportunity a second ago, I'm kind of curious too, like with the first couple, like having that kind of instant success, I'm kind of curious, like what opportunities that created for you? Because I imagine a lot of crazy you know, wonky things probably popped up like, hey, would you like to do this or, or yeah. that? Yeah, 
uh, it was really interesting. And like, you know, I'm, I wish that I was the age I am now when we had that opportunity because the internet was different than it is now. Um, but I, I, I do wish that I was, was older and, and actively taking on projects and actively working and, and not a high schooler. <laughs> uh, but I, I do wish that I was, was working on projects and directing things because I really could have leveraged that back then. Right. Uh, and we still did leverage it, but we were really focused on making content only for our channel. So when, when we were growing, of course, I met some great people from it. Uh, Zach King actually, you know, uh, messaged me through watching Chalk Warfare 1. So that was a connection that I've had now since, since that point in my life, you know, we've been in touch and been friends. And that's, that's been a connection that will probably be like a lifetime thing. Uh, we also had the opportunity to work with talent agents that had messaged us who were really interested in our work. So definitely looking back, I really wish I would have taken a little more advantage of it, but I think it was really just the point in my life when we had made the videos and had the success. Uh, but it allowed us to make some music videos. It allowed us to, uh, you know, to start earning some revenue off of our content through advertisements with YouTube and have conversations with, with some brands. And it also allowed us to uh, have some hope that, that we were able to, to make more content and finally have viewership like that. It kind of, it kind of inspired us to make more content. That's ultimately the, the best thing that I think happened from it. Now we've noticed that a lot of stuff kind of has like a, you know, a natural flow of events where if like, for instance, our film Chalk Warfare 4 that we made, it was way different from the previous ones we had made many years before, because those ones had a very natural explosion where a lot of people that we had that didn't know who we were, and didn't know about our content, had seen through other YouTube channels talking about the, the videos. And this was back before and around 2014 uh, and before that as well for the other parts of the series, one through three. But Chalk Warfare 1 through 3, those all kind of had a push from big channels and people talking about it, right? But with Chalk Warfare 4, we noticed that when we uploaded it, it really was dependent on, of course, an initial push of the network of other people that are in it and sending it out and uh, the fans of the other videos, that obviously helps. But at a certain point, it was like YouTube's algorithm, their machine took over because they just must have so much content that they have to like filter through to decide which ones make it and which ones uh, you know are seen by who and the retention and everything. So we noticed an interesting shift that was a little different this time around where it didn't explode like the other ones did. Uh, it actually had more of a gradual increase, but in the course of six months, Chalk Warfare 4 is about to hit 50 million views, which is pretty crazy to think that the other ones are all kind of around that same amount of view count, but they took around six years to get there. So it's, it's, it was a slower initial rise, but it continued on its trajectory, which was very interesting. In the beginning, while you were making a lot of uh, different content on YouTube, did you both online and offline, like even just in your backyard with your buddies, did you have like a good supporting team of people around you? I've always found that to be the interesting thing, like as a solo shooter or as a group. That's the hard thing about making content. And I, and I think about this to this day, like I was very fortunate with the, uh, the group of guys that, you know, I, I was able to work with. And, I, and I'll speak about that in just a second, because the thing is that when we were making content, we were obviously younger and we we're looking up to content creators that were older, they were in their 20s to 30s. And they made some really cool stuff. And we wanted to have that caliber and have that legitimacy, right? Make content that, you know, at the end of the day, if I got, if I became the best at visual effects, but I was still like, if, and I was like, you know, in high school or around graduating high school, I was still a high schooler making content. Even if my, even if the visual effects looked phenomenal, the people acting in it were still going to be younger and it wasn't going to have that legitimacy that you see on uh you know high and short films on be spike feature, feature productions versus. tv yeah so we were very fortunate that i grew up in uh greenville south carolina so i was very fortunate that when i was making content and i was younger i got in touch with some some guys that had gone to college in north greenville university and they're part of the film program and these are older guys, uh, a few years older than I was. So they're around, you know, 21 to 24. And 
they all loved doing stunt work. They all loved doing just videography. And this was around the 2010 to 2014 era when DSLRs were first becoming a thing. So we all geeked out over DSLRs. We geeked out over camera gear. And these guys were always available with their buddies as well to join in on our films. And, you know, one of, one of the guys that still makes amazing content to this day is a phenomenal filmmaker was uh, Justin Robinson. So he He's just a phenomenal filmmaker. I'm not too sure if you're familiar with him, but he was one of the guys that contacted me initially and was in some of our very early on shorts. So they finally gave us this legitimacy where we were creating content and we had an action scene and the guys actually looked like they were in a war zone. And, you know, they were, they were bigger guys and they, it, it gave a, a better look to our videos. So with that being said, then it was up to my visual effects to put the final spice on the, uh, the projects. And that's kind of what you saw with like Chalk Warfare 1, 2, and 3. You know, a lot of them were friends of ours. Uh, and then, of course, you know, my, my buddy, my partner on the channel, Eric, uh, would always be peppered in there. So there'd always be this younger guy with all the older guys. Uh, but yeah, that, it, it's hard to jump into film because you, it's a communal thing. There, there's so many different parts, parts to, the, uh, to the process. And you can be somebody who is a on the technical side, you can be somebody who is kind of a jack of all trades. And that's kind of the joke, or not necessarily the joke, but that's kind of the mindset that we have with YouTube is you kind of have to be a jack of all trades when you're making content for yourself because you have to understand the process of everything. You have to know when you're shooting something during production that, you know, uh, you have to know if it's gonna work in the edit. You know, you have to know the technical side of it if the camera is actually capturing what you need for the best possible quality uh, or for VFX and whatnot. All of that kind of goes on and you can be a jack of all trades. But when it comes time to actual for actual production, it's, it's a communal thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as an independent creator, you can have all the software side, but sometimes it's hard to tell that story if you're limited with involvement. So, yeah, yeah, you, it's, it's always helpful to have a, a core group of, of people that are really interested in the same thing and, and want to make a cool product. I mean, I think relationships are everything. And I'm just curious for you, both then and also now, like how typically do a lot of these relationships start? Yeah, yeah. It can be really anything. You know, I, again, I'm from South Carolina. So when I was living out in California and working out there, uh, one of the stories I like to tell most is, you know, I, I was on a commercial uh, with a, a company uh, called Step Studios, and we were shooting a Discover commercial. So I was VFX supervising for this project because they had quite a few visual effects for this card company. And I uh, was at the lunch break. I hadn't worked with this company ever before in terms of uh, onset supervision. And I didn't really know the core group of people that they worked with. So I'm on set and it's lunchtime and I'm just looking around. I'm like wondering, hmm, who am I going to sit with? And I just see some guys over there that, you know, looked at like they're having some inter an entertaining conversation and I go and meet with them and I find out that they were, li were literally from North Carolina, uh, you know, <clears throat> grew up in the same area as me, we're out there and these guys were just heavy into tech uh, and they just do, they were doing some phenomenal stuff. They were, you know, they were a part of this drone craze that's going on right now with putting on cinema cameras on drones. Uh, and these guys uh, run a company called Ether Films. So, you know, it just, it starts through this networking because uh, you know, I opened up conversation with them. I introduced myself, showed some of my content. They showed me theirs. We kept that conversation going. And then we ended up doing quite a few projects together. And then they ended up being the, uh, the tech on chalk, on chalk warfare four. So extremely helpful. And I'm extremely appreciative of all those guys because, you know, they showed up in, uh, Davis, who is one of the heads at that company was literally, uh, providing us with the cinema lenses that we were shooting on. And he was, uh, helping us with, we, we had a, uh, a car that had a cinema camera stabilized on top of it, a little Rover. And we were utilizing that for a lot of shots. And, you know, he, this is the guy that has that setup that was helping us be able to achieve the vision that we had. So it, it's really just the, the networking like that. And it's cool now to see that, you know, you, as everyone progresses with the work that they're doing, you, you continue to keep in touch, you know, and I, I'm keeping in touch with, with Davis and Ether Films because they, they were literally just shooting with Michael Bay on a, doing some drone stuff for them with their, with their cool drone tech. It's like everything evolves, but the networking is something that keeps everyone connected, obviously. And it, it allows you to, to continue on with your projects and make cool things. That's one of the most important things in my opinion. And it's always important to keep those connections open and be up to date with what people are doing. Yeah. I 
come across that a lot. I think a lot of people do think that networking is hard. Like I got to talk to people. Like, how do I do that? And it's just like, you reach out, you, if anything, because a lot of times people do try and make relationships too transactional. It's like, hi, I want this or do this for me instead of like, Hey, cool. Oh, stuff, yeah. Freaking awesome. Anything I can do to help. You know? I could, I couldn't agree more in terms of even just some of the, we had a lot of influencers in chalk warfare. And I realize I keep talking about this, but I think it's a good example of this as well, because even people that weren't behind the camera, people that were in front of the screen, those are all relationships, personal relationships where people just wanted to be a part of the project. And I also just want to be a part of their projects. Uh, you know, we had uh, a lot of influencers that helped us get kind of an initial push on the film. You know, we had Zach in there who I've mentioned before. I had, I've had a great relationship with for a long time. Um, I had Jamie Costa, who's been in a lot of the films, who's a great actor and uh, Star Wars Theory. That was somebody who I met through Jamie Costa and I just reached out to, and he has a huge YouTube channel all about Star Wars Theory. Uh, and then one of one of the best examples, I think that of what you were just mentioning was that uh, one of the actresses in the film who had the Harry Potter wand. She, awesome. her, name's, her name's Lana. And uh, I met her actually at an event at Universal Orlando Resorts like three years ago. Lorena. And we developed a friendship where it was just, you know, we were both here doing a, a project with Universal for their uh, influencer-based marketing and both lived in the same area in California. So when we flew back, we kind of kept in touch, you know, and, and she has a huge Harry Potter audience. So I, I was at a, there was a point where I was helping her with some of her Harry Potter effects because I enjoy doing the effects and it was cool getting to do stuff that I had really never done before. And then, you know, when it comes time to talk about other projects, I, I just think, you know, hell, this would be a really good spot to put Lana in this film. Mm -hmm. And because of that connection and because, you know, you're just genuinely trying to all succeed and, and make cool stuff. It's, it's, it's a good time when you have the right people that just want to have a good, like create a great product, you know? Yeah. And, you know, you're working on these ambitious things. And I love that you kind of started with an MVP kind of approach to doing the first one, but obviously the, the point of doing another one is to get more ambitious. Yeah. I'm sometimes curious. you, Sorry. I was just going to say, sometimes you don't know that you're even making a, you know, an MVP of, of that particular product, you know, like we, we had no clue. We were just making a film. Right. So, you know, at the end of the day, I think it's just jump in and make something. And I think that's one of the biggest things. Regret it later. Like realize what a yeah, horrible yeah. mess you <laughs> yourself into. Like yeah. so much pain and suffering can go on making something like we had with Chalk Warfare. It's like we spent so long on that. And even the final hours, we were pulling all nighters to finish it because we had promised to have it come out. And you know, we're sitting there thinking to ourselves, I'd much rather have my eyes completely bloodshot red by staying up for 36, 48 hours uh, mm -hmm. now than put out a product that I'm not proud of. So yeah, you know, it, it, it feels good when you, when you can accomplish that and you can feel proud of something that you, you've uploaded. And at the end of the day, that's kind of always been my goal. So keeping well, that in mind and yeah, it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting field, you know, and it's ever changing mm -hmm. and we're all kind of along for the ride. So it's always good to hear. I, I love what you said a second, well, a couple of things you said, but like one specifically, that's something I've had to kind of retrain myself about. Cause I think that I probably went through 10 years where I just stopped really giving a shit about the work I'm doing. It's like, it, you know, I'm more looking at it as a way to finance drinking and flying to different parties. But right, right. then um, that was kind of one philosophy I started to train myself with, which was that once it's out the door, it's set in stone. And like the shows like God of War, like the Super Bowl one they did, like that was kind of the first time I started really caring again, where it's like, once this is done, am I going to look back and be like, ah, oh, that things should have been fixed. But, ah, there's that. So like even New Year's Day, everyone's out partying the, the next morning. I'm still locked at the office trying to get everything perfect. Yeah. Because then I can look back and be proud about something instead of looking back like, eh, it was a paycheck. You know? Yeah. And sometimes, sometimes looking back at your old work is, you know, it's, it's inevitable that you'll, you'll look at it and say, yeah, like this isn't up to par because well, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad. Uh, it, because if you know that you put in your all to make it the best possible piece of content at the time that you were able to make, that just shows then later that if you look back at it, you have improved in terms of your abilities, in terms of your knowledge. 
And that's kind of how we started to feel when we made the Chalk Warfare episode, because we realized we made the, when we were planning and doing our early on pre-visualization tests for Chalk Warfare 4, we we're looking at it and we're saying, man, this is so much better than the third one. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, man, I wish the third one was better. But then I realized, no, the third one, we really enjoyed making that. And I was really proud of it at the time. And that's just a testament to, to the improvement in tech, to the improvement of, of our knowledge, of you know, the time that we've put in learning new stuff. And it's allowed us to, to make a better piece of content. And it's kind of that, that, you know, growing and making new content and always wanting to be proud of it. That's honestly a, a good recipe for success. Cause I think that, that, at, that at the end of the day is going to be what allows you to, you know, continue forward and feeling good about your stuff. Do you want to walk through a little bit of the creative process of Chalk Wars 4? Like in terms of, Hey, I've got this idea that's going to consume us for the next few yeah. years. Yeah, we, I, I have always want, I always wanted to make it. Uh, I always wanted to make a new one, but I told myself I wasn't going to make it unless it was w- way better than the previous ones or there was a video game attached to it. And hopefully if there was a video game attached to it, it would be also way better than the other ones. <laughs> but the idea was that it needed to be as good as possible with, and, and we needed to make something that was different. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of, I like to think that's what we achieved with this new one. But at the end of the day, or sorry, rather to start, it really was just gaining that confidence because even though we had three of them out, it became increasingly hard for me to agree to jump into a new project because it's almost like, I think that there's another graph to be made showcasing how much knowledge you have on a given subject versus how anxious you are about like making a piece of content right? Like, okay, like, for instance, with, with visual effects, or filmmaking, the more you know about filmmaking, the harder it is to make a film, because you always will want better gear, you're always going to want better lighting, and your quality standards go so high, that it almost it hits a point of diminishing return, unfortunately. And with Chalk Warfare, I just knew it needed to be better. And I knew it needed to be like a great piece of content. And truth be told, we could have made one a couple months or a year after the third one. And it very well could have been better, but the tech wouldn't have been there. And, and all around, it would have been a holistic uh, approach to being a better piece of content. Because what we decided to improve on was from the ground up, how we were going to make the content. So the question was, how can we make it faster faster? How can we make it better? And hopefully it's going to be cheaper. At the end of the day, it wasn't necessarily cheaper, but the other two things really, really worked out. So we started with pre-visualization tests. Before we even asked anybody what we wanted and told anybody they were making another one, we said, is there a way to improve this process? And I started working with a buddy that I had met in college uh, named Brendan, who uh, is one of my VFX partners that we do our visual effects work with. He's very technical. He does he uh, had just finished working on a huge project that involved a ton of synth eyes tracking. So I got him on board and we started discussing plans to completely outfit the, the tracking solution to be able to have these weapons pretty much be, uh, you know, like a standard for tracking. So we can have real 3D tracking and it would stick like glue, unlike the other films where it was a lot of hand tracking, a lot of manual work and a lot of planar tracking. So improving the tracking. And the second thing was trying to figure out how we could not have to paint out so much. And there's a lot of stuff that's happening right now with tech that's going to hopefully even improve maybe a Chalk Warfare 5 one day. But in terms of this, we ended up going with a physical-based solution, which was let's get the weapons cut in a clear plexiglass. Oh, I actually have one right here. <laughs> How handy. Let's get the, and this one's broken because someone dropped it. But it was let's get the weapons cut in a clear plexiglass solution. Right. So there's still reflection, unfortunately, which became a thing that we'd fix later. Uh, but when you're holding it the right lighting, we no longer have to have uh, a paint out solution. Uh, there still has to be a little bit of paint out, but it, it's not nearly as bad as it used to be. So the paint out, it's not nearly as bad as it used to be. And that improved the process quite a bit. And it also improved the weapons because, you know, we had originally made cardboard cutouts and they were, they were just from my head 
my hand would just cut them with an exacto knife and then we would match them later but this time around we actually designed all the weapons in the computer first and uh, developed this solution here so we made that kind of m16 model or and got a cut out from a, a prop shop that we had worked with on some of our uh, virtual reality stuff. Mm -hmm. They made us this one product. It was like, it was like a $150 cutout. Like I was paying like so much for a piece of plastic. Mm -hmm. You're like, why? And he's, and he tells me, listen, when you come to me with like 30 of these, it'll be way cheaper. And I was like, okay, like this is, we'll pay for one with a hundred, 150 bucks just to have and see if this works. Anyways, we got this thing cut out and it became a big question of how thick do we want it? Uh, all these things. And we ended up testing all of this out and we learned a lot. And after we proved that we could do an entire workflow and we improved the process from the ground up and had a beautifully tracked weapon, we decided to just dive right in and say that we're making another one. So that involved the same process as the third one. We went to our fans on the YouTube community page, which was really cool because YouTube now had a new community page where you could interact with people, which they didn't have when we made Chalk Warfare 3. So we just put a post out that had a little bit of a hero image showing that we we're making a 4.0 and asked for weapon suggestions. We got a, a ton of responses and I then took it upon myself to craft kind of a storyline because I knew what I wanted to do before we even announced it. I knew we wanted to do Battle Royale because the whole ethos, right? The, or rather the, the entire storyline of this film, even beyond the film itself was that things have changed Tech has changed, so we've improved the film all around. Things have changed, the video games have changed because it's been so long since we made another one and we've changed as filmmakers and we're gonna make a better better film. So that was kind of the, the goal of the entire project. And I kind of made that clear to the, you know, the, the, the guys working on it and everything. And it then became this huge process of figuring out so much stuff, like how are we gonna do skydiving for a battle royale sequence? How are we gonna do uh, 16 weapons? Like that's a lot of people. Uh, and then even just the process of working with such a limited budget, it was so difficult because I had all of these amazing friends that I had in, in California, uh, a lot of the influencers and friends that I wanted to be a part of, have, have be a part of it. And then I also had a, all of the original awesome guys from South Carolina that I still wanted to be a part of it. So it became this thing where we effectively made two videos we shot half of it in California, half of it in South Carolina, never cross-pollinated. Uh, you had wow. no clue that that ever happened. They actually, it was all the exterior was South Carolina. All the interior was California and the actors never communicated. And uh, so it was, it was like an eight versus eight sort of thing where we did eight actors on one, eight actors on the other, but all the stunts uh, were done in the warehouse. So it was, it was very formulaic in that sense that we cut the thing in half and that was due to a number of reasons. It was due to budgets. It was just due to limitations on us being able to go to these two different places, largely because of budget. <laughs> uh, yeah, at the end of the day, it all comes down to money. But that was a solution that we came up with was we'll split it into four teams. We'll pack certain people that are in certain areas of the U.S. on certain teams, and that will dictate where we are able to film. But yeah, the, the process of just coming up with all of that was really hard you know because it there's so many routes you can take and even the question of if we're doing battle royale how are we going to do skydiving and then one of us was jokingly like let's do it for real and i then i'm thinking to myself and this goes back to the networking question it goes how are we going to do this for real because i'm sitting there thinking you know we're going to do skydiving on a green screen and ironically i asked our stunt coordinator how much that would cost and it costs a lot to just hoist somebody up on a, a wire. I didn't realize that well, to the point where the cost was like, we, I know, I know that we could skydive for the, like cheaper than this. And, and we didn't have the money to be able to do that. So what we did was we realized I started communicating with some people in my network and hit up my friend, Aaron, who used to skydive. And he just says, yeah, I've got a buddy who skydives. He probably knows some videographers. Uh, so we hit up Chris, Chris Pats, and he, introduced us to a professional skydive videographer um, who had done 7,500 jumps. And we put together, we assembled a team, got all the helmets to make it, to cover the people's faces so you couldn't tell that they weren't the same actors. 
and they were actually just skydivers and somehow are able to film a sequence in the air with a with a pre-visualization that i gave them so, so sorry to interrupt like how many takes in other words how many jumps did you have to do to get everything because i i was aware of this when i watched shock wars 4 for the first time because i didn't even know you never told me it came out so i yeah. randomly googled it one time like oh shit this thing's out and i was just blown away by like how perfectly executed it was i was like fuck did you guys jump like 12 it's times a in a day or what no we only we had four jumps and i went on one of them for fun so we were limited to four jumps. It's what we could afford. Uh, and that's all they could do in a day. So it's actually really interesting how it worked. And it was, it was one of like, looking back at it, it was some of the most fun I had had shooting something because we showed up and I had this pre-visualization and again, anybody listening, they can watch the behind the scenes as well. A lot of this is talked about in obviously a more condensed form, but you can see the pre-visualization there. Uh, but I made this pre-visualization that Basically, it was just three S Max bipeds like falling. And I had like a full blown sequence of introducing all four teams. So the point was show, show some sticks of chalk, introduce all four teams, have the antagonist character hit our female actress off course. That's all we needed to execute from the shoot. And I understood going into it that I have a dream here and it likely is going to get limited because we're doing this for real. And there's, there's going to be things that, that you can't account for, you know, right. there's going to be problems. Things happen. things are going to happen. And we went in there with that pre-visualization and it's just a testament to the crew that we were working with. Uh, they, they just truly like all the credits you can, you can find in the description um, because they're obviously like eight, eight individuals plus the videographer. So we had 10 skydivers and it's it's just a testament to how incredible they are, you know how how, how many how many times they've jumped out of planes and are able to maneuver their bodies like a steady cam, with a black magic camera on their helmet and and film these shots. Uh, but some of the shots did end up being CG. Uh, I will say some of the close up stuff because what we found was when you're when you're when you're falling out of the air, it's really hard to like get a close up of a stick of chalk. <laughs> Because their hands are literally swaying so much yeah. that you'd have to be parented, right? Like VFX term, right? You'd have to be like parented, right? To that hand for that to actually look right. And then add a little bit of wiggle after. So that's a little bit of a different thing where there's a perception that, that you wouldn't understand without having going. Mm -hmm. And also just another thing is in the skydiving community, they were very frowning on the fact that they were flying on their bellies but that's the slowest way to fly. And it's the most appealing for video. So it was actually a really funny conversation I had with Chris, who was explaining to me, they, they fly like straight down, right? Cause that's their, their, their least aerodynamic or most aerodynamic rather. And they're going as fast as possible. They're hitting like cutting through the air instead of, yeah, they're hitting like 160 to 200 miles an hour, I think. But if anything, it's, it gives you a longer shoot time. Yeah. So we get, so we only had 50, it was 50 second drop and we had, 30 seconds of usable footage every take. So they have, cause they have to get into position and everything. So when they're on their bellies flying, you get more time. But from the skydiver's perspective, it's pretty lame. But from my perspective and probably yours, we know no different. Skydiving, skydiving, it's cool. And it honestly looked better because you're shooting in a vertical window. So this was a big problem we dealt with was we showed up for a prep day and we got to see some of them skydiving and some of the footage uh, and we weren't filming anything for the video we we're just testing things out we noticed that uh chris was really giving tom cruise a hard time for his jump and mission impossible <laughs> and i started to question why and the reason why was because he was flying on his belly right and to a skydiver that's trained that's the simplest way to fly but on a video format that's shot in a 16 by nine or two, three, five aspect ratio, right? You want them to cover that frame and feel full. You don't want them to be vertical in a frame that's horizontal. So that was also the other reason why it just compositionally made so much more sense. So I unfortunately had to, to let them know that we had to do the belly skydiving. <laughs> 
And that was kind of a funny thing because I never would have thought that that would be like a thing that would have been in question, you know? It's, I was trying to say like, it's, it's funny when people are passionate about something. Like my wife is a professional swimmer. Uh, she could have gone to the Olympics when she was a lot younger. She'd been swimming, for, like she'd been training for 18 years swimming. And so like anytime someone's, in a movie swimming it's just like here we go and uh you know naturally she's going to comment on bad form everything and yeah there's one of my best friends uh wife same thing she's russian so naturally every movie it has a, a russian accent she's like oh that that was lame or oh they did a good job and so it's just kind of funny like you you're so passionate about something that you've got to um not, not even give your two cents it's more you've got to kind of discriminate and kind of Add, add a, you know, your perspective on the whole thing. Yeah, it, it, it happens all too often. Like, I mean, I, I've even fallen into, into the trap where, like, I, I got into motorcycles a few years ago, and now when I see them riding motorcycles in movies, I'm like, right. that, it's like that doesn't make sense. Like, that's not how, <laughs> you know? <laughs> exactly. And even for a layman, like, um, for me, I was very self-aware, like, looking at the the whole skydiving scene, just knowing how limited time you have in the air between jumping out of a plane and splatting yeah. on the ground or landing successfully, but very, very little time to shoot, choreograph yeah. and direct it all. It's not a lot. It's, and again, like, again, we only have like 30 seconds because once they, they did these formations to learn how to, or to all be on the same page with how they were going to get in there. And a lot of them, if they're going down in a group of four, which were the teams, they would hold each other's hands. Right. And then all be together and then they would separate out. And it was incredible because you could even see in some of the footage, you'd see our actor or sorry, our cameraman who had the helmet on, he'd kind of give them a visual cue and they'd all follow and they're in the air falling. And all of this is going on. Like, I think it's hard enough to shoot a film on the ground, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's hard enough to get a, a great take there, but some of the stuff they were able to achieve uh, was absolutely incredible. Like we had this one shot where we, that, that one hero shot where it pans over and then our antagonist team crosses the foreground as the, as the, uh, the, our hero team is our pink team. The hero team is in the background. We actually on the second jump, sorry, on the third jump had a pretty okay version of it. It had a little bit of a tilt up. It wasn't a reveal and that was very frustrating, but when we got down and this kind of is a testament to, to working with guys that just love what they do, you know, when we got down on the ground, the videographer uh, and the crew were like, we can do it better. Like we can, they're like, we can get it. We just need one more, one more go. And I was like, all right, like, let's do it. And that was the one where I actually went to, but I didn't get to see them do it, but they absolutely nailed it. So again, we only had four runs, uh, which is stressful, but you know, when you're working with people that are really good at what they do, it, mm -hmm. it can be enough. And it, there was some stuff we weren't able to get, like I had mentioned, but there's nothing that, you know, us being VFX guys, there's nothing you can't fix, but a sequence that's as wide as that and as like intricate with the, the flyers, I'm very, very glad that we did it uh, practically. I was curious in terms of like location scouting as well. Like, was that easy to find? Because for me, like, I, I love California for that reason of like trying to find really awesome locations to go shoot on. Um, did you have a permit? was is also the other part of it but i'm just curious like how easy was it to find the exterior location uh to shoot for okay so the exterior location goes into my background with living in south carolina so south carolina obviously has they have a ton of industrial mills so when i say we came back to shoot with our second half of our crew in south carolina i actually know a lot of guys just because i'm kind of involved with the town here and i grew up here so i i I have a little bit of better foot in the door when it comes to like knowing a guy for something. Uh, but I actually grew up with somebody who had a stake in one of these mills and they converted it to a, like a production kind of co-working space. And it's a popular thing here in South Carolina where they, they gentrify these mills and turn them into apartment lofts, right. With these high ceilings and the exposed brick and, you know, people love it. Right. Yep. But I, I was able to get in touch with somebody from the past and uh, got in touch with this great guy named uh, Lawrence Black, who owns a uh, owns a big 
piece of mill property here in Greenville, and then also owned a second one that they had just purchased that wasn't being used yet. And I started communicating with him and told him about the film and he just loved what we were doing. And we were able to get his permission to be able to shoot there for the project. So all of the exteriors were from that mill and some of the surrounding ones. And it even had that water tower, which was perfect because we needed that for the storyline. So we didn't have to really, you know, we had to still make it in CG, but we had it there for all the, the actual practical shots, which was really cool. And yeah, we were able to shoot the entire thing on that location. And that kind of gave it that kind of gritty look, you know? And then when it came time for uh, California shooting, that warehouse is extremely recognizable. I don't know if you've kind of seen it around, but it was in Inception. Um, it was in Ford versus Ferrari. I've seen it in a ton of commercials. Ever since we shot there, I now see it everywhere. It's like kind of one of those things where, yeah. Yeah, I, I'll just quickly say like, even just yesterday, one of my buddies sent me a picture of a bar we always drink at and it's like some movie, I forget which movie it was, but it's just, you're right. Like there's an overpass or a bridge or, uh, sorry, I was quickly saying, my wife is watching um, Crazy Stupid Love with Steve Carell and yeah. Uh, what's in it and yeah i was just like oh i was gonna fast forward a bit like hey here's where we go to the movies every weekend like it's in the background of the theater um yeah yeah it's crazy how like everything's so recognizable once you you notice it all yeah it's it's you know the sheer amount of content being made in the limited amount of places to film in you start to see some repeats and this location in california is really cool uh i think it's the s scs warehouse if anyone's interested in ever shooting there but Awesome guy named Ron owns it. And it's just a really cool, really cool area. And one of my buddies who had invited me to one of his movie premieres, uh, Joe Sill, who does a lot of visual effects work as well, he had in uh he had the the location in his film. And I saw that when I was trying to plan for Chop Warfare and just straight up was like, where is that? I need to shoot at it. So he gave me the contact information and again, the networking, right? It's like somebody that I had known through college and just was in the industry uh, shot at this cool place. And I wanted to go support and see his movie. And that led to us probably entering a completely different tangent than would have happened if I didn't go. Cause I wouldn't have found out about that location. That's so cool. Um, so the interior is California, the exterior is South Carolina. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, like during all the shooting, like what was, some of the more, I guess, either the most challenging scene or just in general, like what was some of the most challenging parts of making this whole thing? One of the things that's the hardest, because again, like we didn't, we we're working on limited budget and we shot in the California bit for two days. And one of the hardest things was jam, like was, was jamming in all of the stunts in our first day of production because we had the budget to be able to afford for all of this, all of the stunt actors and actresses and our stunt coordinator and all of the crew hands for that one day. And that involved us having to do the flips uh, that our actress Tiana did, uh, the tuck and rolls and uh, any other wire work where Brett got picked up right by the magic hand. All of those stunts had to be jam packed into one day which was very, very difficult. And somehow we pulled it off. And I, I think it's just, I think it's just due to how running gun we're able to be, which is not easy, but it just comes through doing YouTube. Uh, but somehow we were able to pull it off. And even the stunt coordinator was like, listen, this type of stuff would normally take like five to six days for a movie to make. So hopefully it looked good in their eyes, but you know, we were able to that was the hardest. Like I, I remember walking out of there and there's just some video of me where I'm just, I am, I'm like just sweating and I have like dirt all over my hands. Cause I was literally running around with this, with the camera and I'm manning the camera for a lot of it. We had two cameras, uh, ether films was helping us man the other camera. And a lot of times I'm even pulling focus. Cause I like just to, to be raw and be able to, to kind of manage all of that. And that was just by far one of the hardest shoots we'd ever done. And we finished that one day and then had like a nice five day break until we went back. And there was a production that came in the warehouse in between that time. Mm -hmm. So we took a nice break and then we did all of the stuff with our influencers that didn't involve any stunts. 
so that was stuff like the the Star Wars uh, battle um, and some some of the other effects. So it was really hard working with everyone's schedule, obviously, and being able to like coordinate all of that. But when it came time to just jam packing everything into one one day, that was that was a lot of work. So I'm um, just curious, like, what were you filming on, what gear? Oh, so yeah, everything and. You know, obviously, shout out to one of the sponsors. It's Black Magic. So we we love Black Magic cameras. Had them on the podcast, so they're, they're, they yeah. they they uh, approve. <laughs> yeah, they. I mean, I even if they weren't a sponsor, I would have used their cameras. I'm a big fan of the the Black Magic uh, equipment. So we use the the Ursa G2, and we had two of them on set. Uh, well, yeah, we use that for the entire film, and for the skydiving, we had a uh, the the pocket cinema. So. Yeah, some great, some great tech. And then obviously it works well with DaVinci Resolve and that entire color workflow and edit workflow. Cool. I love that. Um, that's awesome, man. Like it's so cool. And in general, like uh, either photogrammetry to kind of map out the place for tracking, stuff like that is, I figure everyone's probably getting mad at me if I don't nerd out at least a little bit about the technical stuff. So one of the funny things, and, and this is again, just like speaking on networking, speaking on uh, just talking to individuals and, and learning more. We were shooting in South Carolina at this mill and there was this guy walking around and we were curious. So some of the guys started talking to him and we found out that that guy was actually commissioned to scan the entire mill <laughs> with, with, with laser scanners. And he had gone to Clemson University uh, to to study that and he was just great at it and he had high resolution scans of like like 100 gigabytes of scans of this entire location including interior which we weren't even using so somehow the, we met him and he was there on that day Freaking he was timing, really in, he was really into what we were doing and sent us uh, we got his email and when it came time to doing post-production, we just emailed him and said, hey, do you still have those scans? And he sent them to us. So all I had to do was go back and grab all of the texture data because unfortunately he didn't have the texture data. So I went back and got thousands upon thousands of photographs of the location uh, when it was cloudy, mm -hmm. which isn't hard to come by during <laughs> the uh, summer times here. And we were able to match everything up with like anchor points and capturing reality, which is some great software for this, and made an entire map that, uh, of the, you know, photo uh, of the location that we shot on. And we were able to do a lot of virtual kind of production with that too. So it allowed us to, I almost wish we had it for pre-visualization for the film, but, you know, better late than ever. But we were able to utilize that for things like when the water tower collapsed, we had it in the background. So there's even just like a slight bit of parallax where you could have just used a background plate, but we were actually able to walk around that scene. And it was just extremely beneficial for the entire process then after. By the way, we have to give you credit for some of the awesome work you did in Chalk Warfare as well. So, so Alan did the, uh, did the water tower falling and uh, water simulation. Absolutely incredible. That was fun. Uh, I'll, I'll quickly talk about that for a second just because I, I think it's funny because originally you're like, hey, do you want to help out? I never do free jobs ever. And uh, in this case, came on like this, you know, the stuff you guys are doing looks really cool. And I thought it'd just be a fun experiment. But originally you're like, hey, we just want like a wall being broken and I think like a gun melting. I'm like, okay, yeah, I can handle that with all the other workload. And then it changed to one shot of background tower falling fully dynamic water falling out spilling onto a chalk monster and melting <laughs> flashing the camera, all one shot and it's just like even if this was paid i'd, I'd still be hesitant to think it was so. yeah it, it it turned out absolutely amazing and the like the water tower the water tower uh, simulation you created was incredible and and to speak to that too yeah there was a yeah it's like it's it's not easy when you're making these videos because it's like at a certain point I was handling all the water, but then we had talked and then there was like a certain time where you were free and you weren't. So it's like, okay, well, I have to do the wall break now. So I'll do that one. And it turns into this thing where it, uh, it, it just gets. <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I mean though. Like, um, I think with this project in general, you, you know, it kind of goes back to what I was saying before about like caring about certain projects. Like 
you you managed to acquire so many talented people to be on the project the the whole thing and that's why i was also asking earlier on like you know hey i want to see uh, a rough edit or something because it helps me get my head into it but right, right. that's also what kind of re-excites me about seeing the stuff you guys are doing like i think that yeah. it's rare to kind of jump on a project that's just like this is going to be fucking cool and right. um it just kind of makes everyone be like yeah let's get band together and i'm blown away by the fact that something of this caliber it kind of goes back to what you're saying before about in the beginning you're just fumbling around making something cool but suddenly the expectation so high yeah the expectation it. rises and you know and again that's why i'm 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 so thankful for you know you know people like you that that are are open to to hearing me out when when we say you know we want to make this product we want to make this video it's a uh, it's a, it's a big ask, but are you, are you open to trying and helping us and working with us? And, you know, I, I'm very appreciative of, of you and this, uh, for this, because, you know, it, it turned out great. I honestly, like I, it, w- there's a lot of tie flow work we were doing and mm-hmm. I'm, I'm very proud of the, proud of the results and your, your water tower fall, honestly, it was, oh yeah, couldn't, I couldn't have done that. So. <laughs> uh, thanks, man. You were talking earlier about mega scans using Quicksource tools. So I figured it might be interesting to talk about that, especially because I usually hear everyone talking about how they leveraged it in video games and not necessarily in film. So what was that experience like? With specifically just pre-made assets and Quixel? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, those services are all here to help people like us make better content. And, and I'm all for it. Like we, we were able to jump in and we needed to make, we, we had the shot and chalk warfare where the little RC car is driving and I had to have a nice high resolution model of a road, some plants and uh, a curbside. And they just made it so easy for me to just go in there and make that little section and have that car drive. And I, I was just, uh, you know, it's services like that. And again, it's to, to the testament of just Unreal Engine working with creators, like them also partnering with companies like that and and you know the acquisitions that they're they're having it's it's amazing that content like like stuff like that is accessible and in a lot of cases free now that's it's huge i'm so impressed especially when you have big software companies acquiring lots of other companies and usually it's a bad thing so i'm i'm always curious i'm always reading the comments and i was saying this to teddy actually that i'm just blown away at how positive everyone is opposed to oh god here's the death of x product you know yeah i think it's a i think it's a real testament to unreal engine as like as a company and I, tim sweeney as well as the ceo of unreal engine i i think that they're really working towards the creator you know working towards just making great products because also their business model was really based off of like succeeding if you succeeded because they had the unreal engine for free and then you only paid uh, a percentage of your of your earnings if you succeeded past a certain point so it seems that that's kind of been ingrained in that company and i, I think that's great because i know that if i was getting started with visual effects mm-hmm. unreal engine would be what i'm starting in and it's because it's a fantastic platform and it's also free you know you can go and just download it no questions asked. One thing I've always thought was interesting is, I think you had mentioned launching, like uh, releasing YouTube videos on a Saturday and Nico over at Cardo Crew, or Cardo Digital, sorry, but um, he was telling me the same thing that like, they always release Saturday mornings and just kind of stick to that routine. I, I think that, and this is something we dealt with a lot um, because we had success with all of the original films, one through three, and those were all released on weekdays. And I noticed a big shift happened in YouTube, which was, and I think it wasn't with YouTube, it's just with the internet in general, is that a lot of the traffic on those films early on would get, would come through from blogs and forums posting the, the content. So it was apparent that it was good to post on a weekday because the people are in office and they will get an email. If you, you know, there was a point where I would send out a lot of emails and I'd be like, Hey, we are releasing chalk warfare three. Uh, you had posted about it. Uh, you had posted about part two. I would love if you would post about this one. And there was a time in the internet where not everyone was out for monetization and not everyone was out there just to 
try to make money and they just enjoyed good content. And it seems like there was a huge shift from when we made 3.0 to 4.0, which was the span of six years from 2014 to 2020. And what I noticed is that no blogs and no articles picked it up. Hmm. No one wanted to, yeah, there was a few, there was a, like none of the ones that I emailed, there was a few that obviously worked with us and, and were really interested in, in, in getting interviews, which I'm, I love doing and I love uh, being able to, you know, like provide insight on some of the work that we've been doing because, because I'm behind camera and I, it's one of the things I love doing, but from an entertainment standpoint, I, it was increasingly hard or it was, inc it was increasingly harder this time around to get, uh, to get some of the more entertainment styled avenues to post about it, unless you offered up cash because I, because a lot of these websites have become monetized and they realize their worth and realize that their articles have value. And, you know, that's fine. Uh, it just was a little bit of a curveball from what I was used to, uh, at least from what I rem had remembered with Chalk Warfare 3. Uh, and that's not to say that articles didn't pick up the video and whatnot. I'm just saying in terms of a lot of the avenues that I thought uh, would still be around or would still be open to posting, had kind of shifted their motto uh, or shifted their kind of way about uh, leveraging content or finding content to post about. So that was a big shift, but luckily for us, I kind of was anticipating that things were going to be different this time around. And one of the things I really wanted to focus on was just making a piece of content good with the hopes that word of mouth at the end of the day, or even just sharing on social media would help it. And we also worked with a lot of influencers that, you know, people that I just enjoy working with. We, did, we didn't want to put anybody on there just because they had a following. That was never our goal. Our goal was working with friends and 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 people that we have, you know, connected with along the way that, you know, if they wanted to post about it, that'd be awesome. Otherwise completely fine. And uh, we're very fortunate that a lot of our, a lot of our influencer based connections and friends that were part of the project really enjoyed the piece and were able to post about it on their platforms and stuff that really helped the view, the view count go up as well. And the launch day, but in terms of to go back to your original question about in terms of which day to launch on, weekdays always seem to be our thing. And I realized the only reason why was because of the blog articles. So what I learned with Chalk Warfare 4 was it really just came about looking at Saturday. And we didn't post on Saturday. We actually posted on a Thursday uh, because I learned the, the, the fact that the blogs were different from Chalk Warfare 4. I was hoping that it would, you know, Thursday would be a good day to pick it up. For some reason, Tuesdays always seemed like a great day back in the day for us to upload. I think all the Chalk Warfares were uploaded on Tuesdays. And I had it in my head, like, okay, we have to upload this video on Tuesday. And I was like, I started to think like, why do we have to upload on a Tuesday? What is so great about Tuesdays? And I started looking into it and realizing that if you look at when people, like when, when studios put up their trailers, it's very often on Tuesdays. Yeah. Monday. So everybody's kind of of this mindset. Yeah. That, that Tuesdays. Are the week. Yeah. Uh, but of course, you know, knowing us, we had a lot of last minute tweaks and the video that was supposed to go up on Tuesday went up on a Thursday. I'm sure as you're working on this stuff, like there's also a whole marketing plan behind it too, that you're constantly thinking about. I don't want to put you on the spot to say divulge everything, but whatever you're comfortable sharing, like for you, what type of thought process went into the marketing? And I'll just quickly add that like, I, I think it's great that, you know, you're always thinking talent and collaboration first rather than uh, leveraging other everyone's audiences. But I did think also strategically that's brilliant that half the cast that you have in this film has a massive audience, which means they're all wanting to watch it because they're passionate about that person. Yeah. And I, I think that's something that you find a lot too, even with just people that are actors and actresses, like, you know, a lot of the actors and actresses that we had in the film that I just said, you know, you are talented and I enjoy working with you and I want you to be in this. They also happen to have an audience and that you're, you're finding that increasingly with a lot of people that it may not be millions of people, but they have an audience of, you know, potentially 10 to hundred, 200,000 people, which, you know, even 10,000 people on an Instagram page, that's a lot of eyeballs. Yeah. And What's more interesting is that those individuals uh, have a very niche 
or specific demographic that follows them, which is really cool. So for instance, uh, we work a lot with um, our buddy, Bob Reese, who is a parkour gymnast. And he's developed a huge following in the parkour community on Instagram and YouTube. And we've always had him in our videos because he's from my hometown. Uh, I love having him in the videos and he's always down to just do cool stunts because he's just athletically capable. So of course it was a no brainer to have him in Chop Warfare 3 or 4. It was a, it was a no, he was in 3 as well, but it was a no brainer to have him in Chop Warfare 4. And, you know, it just so happens that he has an audience as well. And uh, it's cool because he's able to do some stunts in it and show off some of the things that he does best. And I think his audience likes to see that, you know, as, as our audience likes to see visual effects content, uh, the audience of an actor or an actress likes to see them acting or the audience of somebody who does Star Wars content likes to see Star Wars content. So, you know, when we had these ideas of, okay, people are asking for lightsabers, our, our mind is set on who do we know that, you know, does this type of content. And of course, Jamie Costa, who's been in all of the chalk warfares, just got finished doing a Kenobi short film. So we knew going in there that Jamie's got to draw a Kenobi lightsaber or yeah, it's like, it, it just led to, it was just a chain reaction of, of various different pieces to the puzzle, all starting with asking people what they wanted to see crafting a storyline that we had in our heads before that around some of those weapons and then, you know, building it up with our network. I'm kind of curious now to see what the heck you have your sleeve for, you know, whether it's six years, 12 years, a hundred years from now, but um, you know, where the next one's heading to, but this has been awesome, man. I appreciate your time. Uh, and Absolutely. thanks again for everything. Absolutely. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this video. Check out the link in the description below if you want to watch Chalk Warfare 4, as well as I've linked to Sam's YouTube channel as well. Also, if you like this subject and you want me to go deep on it with other content as well, feel free to leave even a simple yes to let me know, and I'll definitely follow up with as much content, as much value I can give to you as possible. I also mentioned this earlier, but right now I just released a free course on how to raise your prices as an artist, how to attract your dream clients, as well as how to do your side hustle. I've been in the industry for 25 plus years, both as an artist, as well as a manager, hiring artists and managing them, paying them. So I'm very familiar with this topic. And for me, it's a pet peeve that artists use the excuse that there's no money in art or art doesn't pay, art's not a real career. I want to eliminate the starving artist mindset for good. So that's why I want to share with you eight hours of training, everything I know about how to price yourself and raise your rates and get what you deserve, as well as building your side hustle as well as an artist. So that way you can leverage your talents to be able to sell assets, be able to do NFTs, everything else in between. So lots to dive into, check it out, pricingclass.com or click the link below the video. You can check it out there. Thanks again for watching. So that's it for me. By the way, it would mean the world to me if you could like and subscribe to this channel as well as share this video because I would love to keep making more content for you. I appreciate you and I look forward to continuing to serve you on your journey to success as an artist. I'm Alan McKay and thanks for watching.